Well, hello, everyone. Um, I, I said in my sermon earlier today that I wanted to do a quick teaching on why uh, we as Christians aren't obligated to, um, to follow the, the Jewish festivals. Uh, the reason why this is such an important thing for me is as we're reading through the, uh, the Old Testament and we see these festivals, um, I've even I've had a, a, a few people ask the question, like, why don't we celebrate Passover? And what's interesting is, is this this last couple of weeks, I've also had a person reach out to me um, and, and really be pretty um, combative in in, uh, in regard to um, they're a part of a cult. Uh, they're a part of a cult that uh, teaches that um, um, unless you uh, celebrate the Jewish festivals, uh, Passover and the other festivals that uh, that you actually can't be saved, that it's actually through celebrating those and they mix Jesus in there with it. But it, you also have to do these other things in order to be able to to, uh, to be forgiven and have salvation. And it's really interesting. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, because uh, what what this cult and so many other cults do is they take things out of context and they don't read. They don't have a good theology. Honestly, they don't have a a biblical theology of salvation, um, of the work of Jesus in, in, uh, in what he did on the cross. And I'm going to cover some of that with you today. And so um, let me just cover real quickly with you. There, there are three major feasts um, that, the, uh, that the Jewish people um, um, celebrate. Uh, the first is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And um, the, the second is the Feast of Weeks. And then the third is the Feast of Ingathering. And let me just give you a real quick uh, you know, overview of, of those. Uh, let me start with Passover first. I don't have that on the list here in front of you that you see, but Passover it is a meal that the Lord had the Israelite people. Um, if you remember, or we're reading through the book of Exodus, you remember as uh, God has sent these plagues on, um, on Egypt and on Pharaoh and telling them, let my people go, right? They were God's chosen people. They were in slavery in Egypt. And God sends all these plagues, but Pharaoh, he hardens his heart. He does not want to let God's people go. And finally, God says, all right, you know, um, I'm going to strike the firstborn of every household. Um, every animal in Egypt is going to be struck dead. And, uh, and so then he instructs the Israelites um, in order for them to be safe when the death angel passes through Egypt, he instructs them, I want you to, I want you to um, slaughter a lamb and I want you to take its blood and I want you to put it on the, the sides of, the, of your doorposts and above your doorpost. And that's going to be a sign to the death angel uh, to, to not strike that home, the first dead in that, firstborn in that home to not strike them dead and the angel will pass over you. And this is what God tells them to do. He says, he, take Take that, that lamb, and I want you to make a meal with it. I want you to cook it. I want you to roast it, and you are to leave, leave none, of it, none of it until morning. Uh, cook the, the lamb, and then I also want you to make bread to eat with the, uh, with the meal. And that bread, I don't want you to put yeast in it. I don't want you to have to take the time where two, three, four, five days later, the yeast finally is working through the bread and rising through the bed. I want you, you're going to have to be ready to leave Egypt as soon as it's time. As soon as finally Pharaoh is going to relent when the, when the firstborn all die, he's going to tell you to leave and I want you to leave quickly. So he actually tells them, you, I want you to cook the bread without any yeast in it. And um, that actually becomes pretty symbolic later on in the, um, uh, you know, in, in the, through the rest of the Bible, um, you know, how yeast works through the bread and they use that for symbolism for sin and how it works through a person's life. But God tells them, I don't want you to put any yeast in it. I want you to eat unleavened bread, um, bread that doesn't rise. Okay. And so, um, that's what they do. And he says, I want you to eat the meal that night with the blood that's been put on your door and the death angel is going to pass through. And I want you to eat that meal with, with your cloaks tucked into your belt, with your sandals on, your staff ready to go and eat that meal because you are going to have to leave quickly. OK, and so that's and so then what happens is he tells them now every year I want you to celebrate the Passover and I want you to celebrate the Passover by having a meal just like they had at the Passover. And I want you to to then that will then begin a week long festival called the Feast of of unleavened bread, where you will remember how God brought you out of slavery 
and brought you into freedom. That's pretty cool. Okay, the second uh, festival is the Festival of Weeks. And that Festival of Weeks celebrates um, how God, they, they left Egypt and then God, they took 50 days to get to Mount Sinai, where God then gave them the Ten Commandments and gave them instructions for social responsibility and living together and just what they had to do as they treated one another and pretty much some, you know, the laws of their society, social laws, uh, but especially the Ten Commandments. And the Feast of Weeks is to celebrate um, how God brought them. You know, and, and that that 50 days, by the way, that's called that day, 50 days when they got to Sinai is called the day of Pentecost, 50, 50 days. And so they were to celebrate a week long uh, festival uh, celebrating how God had brought them to Sinai and had given them the Ten Commandments and the rest of the instructions. So that's the Feast of Weeks. And then the third feast is the Feast of Ingathering. And that's towards the fall season when they bring in their their uh, their harvest, and that is to re, to be reminded now from from Sinai all the rest of the way to the chosen land, and they had their their wilderness wanderings and and the feast of ingathering as they bring in the harvest, they are to remember how God provided for them. Um, as they were camped out, it's also called the Feast of Booths, and they were camped out along the way in these little booths or, or uh, little huts uh, that they made that they lived in while they were traveling from Sinai to the Promised Land. And so every year towards the fall, when they bring in the harvest, they remember how God provided for them um, in, uh, in their wilderness um, wanderings. That's pretty, pretty awesome. Okay. And so the question that's asked then is, is why, why don't we, you know, celebrate those, those uh, festivals? If, if our roots, if Jesus was a Jew and uh, was a Jewish man and, and he celebrated those things, why don't we? And like I said, this, this, this cult specifically uh, basically says that, that we must, if we're going to be saved from our sins, that a part of our responsibility is that we celebrate those festivals. And, and here's the reason. Let me give you a few reasons as to why we don't celebrate, why we're not obligated to celebrate the uh, the festivals. First of all, uh, why we don't celebrate the festivals is, is because the Jewish festivals and holidays, they were specifically given to the Jewish people to remember. Um, you know, here, here's the, the reality is I'm not Jewish. Um, neither are many of you, most of you, if not all of you, you're not Jewish. And, and uh, it was given to specifically the Jewish people for a specific reason. God wanted them to remember. He wanted them to remember when they got into the promised land. He wanted them to remember all that God had done to, pr to, uh, to protect them. Uh, they were going to need to remember that as they went into the promised land. And so they were specifically given to Jewish uh, people. Uh, the second reason um, is that they were they were to remember what God had done for them as a covenant people in bringing them into existence. Let me give you the three. And then the one of the reasons was to, to help them remember that God bringing them out of Egypt, right? Brought them into existence as a chosen people. They were a chosen people, brought them out of Egypt, and then God protecting them in the wilderness wanderings. Those are the three main reasons that God gave it to the Jewish people, those festivals. Okay. Now, now they were specifically, and this is important, they were specifically for the Jewish people. So they wouldn't forget how God had worked on their behalf and forget the covenant that they had made with God. God said to them, Genesis 12, you go back to the covenant God made with Abraham. Then Abraham was the father of, of, of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob, who was the father of his 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. And God made this covenant with them. And it was a threefold covenant. I will make you into a mighty family, a mighty nation. And then not only that, I will, I will, um, I will, um, bless the, I, I will give you your own, uh, promised land. And, and then not only that, then the third is that I will bless the entire world through you. And that was a, a foreshadowing of the Messiah coming through them, through that family tree. And, uh, 
And so they were specifically, they were, they were for Jewish people. So they wouldn't forget that the covenant God had made with them. And now the second reason, uh, the second reason, so it was for them specifically. And the second reason that we don't, we're not obligated to, uh, to celebrate those uh, festivals is because our faith, our faith specifically is not Judaism. We are not Jewish. It is Christianity. And let me explain that because that's very, very important. Uh, see, we aren't waiting uh, for the Messiah. Uh, we believe that Jesus um, is the Messiah who has come uh, to, to take away the sins of the world. And as such, our faith is, is, is not in the constructs of Judaism, uh, which led to the Messiah entering the world, but it's 100%. Our faith is 100% in the work of Jesus Christ. And let me share this important scripture with you in Colossians. Let me show you this because this is important. You're going to need to know this. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, um, look at what it says. Uh, it says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, okay, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Now look at what it says. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. And there are a lot of hollow and deceptive philosophies, friends, which depends on human traditions and on the elemental spiritual principles of this world which is, you know, you do the work, you've got to accomplish salvation and human traditions, the traditions of festivals and Sabbath days. There will be some who are going to, uh, to say, um, say that uh, you have to uh, go to church on a certain day, uh, on the Sabbath, seventh day, because that's what the Jewish people did. Which, by the way, even the Jewish people, Jewish Christians changed that to Sunday in honor of the resurrection within the first uh, within the first generation of of Christianity. Um, you know, so the, these are are deceptive ph philosophies, and they depend on human traditions. And so, most of the cults that are in existence are are focused on human philosophy rather than on Jesus Christ as revealed through God's word, his, his divine and inerrant word. And so, for, for example, for the Mormons, it's Joseph Smith. They rely on Joseph Smith for, for the Jehovah Witnesses. They rely on human tradition, uh, Charles Russell, uh, both of which, by, by the way, um, they, they came after long after Christianity had been, been uh, um, in existence, way long after. And they then were, they were a, these schism teachings. And, um, and, and they, what happens is, is they elevate human philosophy that is usually written in some kind of supplemental writing aside from the Bible that focuses on human tradition and ideas rather than on the truth of Christ revealed in the word of God. And so like, for example, the Book of Mormon or the New World Bible, which, which the Jehovah Witnesses put together and the Watchtower publications. And so it's focused on human ideas, human traditions, instead of the inerrant word of God. Um, so I mentioned I was contacted recently by someone who's part of, of a cult movement uh, that believes the only way to be saved is by following the old Jewish festivals. And what happens is they twist the scriptures like so many cults that take certain things in the Bible out of context and they subvert the way of salvation that's achieved by faith in the death, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. And, and really, if you think about it, when you read your Bibles, it's no different than what the early church faced when there was debate in the book of Acts over whether or not non-Jewish Christians had to follow Jewish customs and laws like circumcision. If you read in there in the book of Acts, in order to be a Jew, you had to be circumcised. And in fact, if you weren't circumcised, they would cut you off because that was a sign that you were God's, a part of God's chosen people. That God gave them that, that sign, right? That you are a Jewish person. And so and what happened is in order to be a Jew, you had to be circumcised. And so they were, they were actually telling Jewish Christians who had become Christians were telling Gentile Christians that if they were to be Christians, that they had to be circumcised. 
And the first century church fathers, led by the apostle Peter, um, who considered who was considered the primary leader of the Christian church, headquartered in Jerusalem, they all met to discuss the issue. You can find that in in the middle part of the book of Acts, Acts thirteen, I believe, and uh, to decide the issue. So they determined in that in that meeting that all people are saved by merit of what Jesus had done on the cross for all humanity, not by following Jewish customs. Christianity was not a new form of Judaism. Okay, that's important. Christianity was not a new form of Judaism. It was but a culmination of the amazing work that God accomplished through Abraham's family, the Israeli people, and is a it's a whole new system of faith, listen, built on Jesus Christ. That's what Colossians 2, 9 through 19 clearly continues to say. So let's let's take a look at that. It continues to say that, um, <coughs> excuse me, we'll continue if I can get it to work. There we go. It says this, all right. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in you, Christ, excuse me, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Okay, so they're, they're, they're settling even this issue of circumcision. Do they have to be Jewish and be circumcised? You were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Okay? When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public, public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now look at this. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So do not let anyone who delights in false humility. In other words, he's saying they're a bit prideful. They've got this heady knowledge they think that they have. And the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about the, what they have seen. And they're puffed up with idle notions but they're unspiritual by their unspiritual mind. Listen to what it says. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. And so this is a thing for us to remember. It's so very important. Okay. Um, don't let anybody judge you by a new moon Sabbath um, with regard to a, a new moon festival um, new moon celebration, a festival, um, a, a Sabbath day. Um, those were the shadow of things to come, but the reality is found in Christ. So, so all worship for us is Jesus focused. It is Jesus focused. It's not on any of those other things that people want to make it. And, um, that's important to remember. Um, now, now let me share just another thought with you. That's, that's important. Uh, someone asked, why don't we celebrate the Passover again, a, a really a good question. And, uh, like I said, we aren't obligated to follow, uh, the Jewish festivals, but there is an interesting thing that I want to note about the Passover that I, I do want to point out to you. Um, in reality, we do celebrate the Passover as Christians. 
Um, if you're familiar with the Last Supper, if you remember, as Jesus was taking the Passover meal with his disciples right before being crucified, he, uh, he did something significant. Jesus took the bread, right? And he, uh, he said, uh, this is my body that has broken, bro been broken for you. This is my blood that is spilled out for you. Take and eat these in remembrance of me. And so uh, Jesus is, uh, in a very real way, um, we celebrate Passover. Jesus has become the Passover lamb. Look at what it says. He took the bread and, and he said, this is my body. You used to celebrate the Passover according to the, the old Jewish tradition, the Passover lamb that was, was given to you to get you out of Egypt. He says, no, that no more are you going to do that. He says, this is this bread that used to signify this now signifies my body. Why I'm the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He says, this blood that you, that this is my blood. And he takes the Jews. He says, this is my blood that has been spilled out for you. Take and eat and drink this um, in remembrance of me. And, and so Jesus has become the Passover lamb. So every time, this is the thing I want us to remember though. Every time we, we take communion together, we're celebrating the Passover. OK, not as Jews escaping Egypt, but as sinners escaping slavery to sin and to death by virtue of Jesus, the Lamb of God. And and so, um, friends, I, I just isn't that awesome. We, we're saved not by observing those things that were that were given specifically for the Jewish people to observe. We are saved by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And so the focus of our worship is forever and always Jesus. All right. So so I just I wanted to arm you with that. That's a part of, you know, our vision is to uh, to move, mobilize and multiply. We want to move you to have a relationship with Jesus. We want to mobilize you uh, to be strong in your faith and we want to mobilize you to uh, to be able to give an answer for your faith. And and undoubtedly, in, especially in these days with uh, with many of the cults that are rising up, um, there are going to be questions that people have uh, for you. And so. Um, I wanted to, to offer this teaching to you. If you have any questions or if you would like the uh, manuscript for this so you have it on hand, feel free to, to let me know. I would be more than glad to, uh, to email that to you, to share it with you. All right. So God bless you. I hope that you found this uh, teaching fruitful and uh, hope you have a, an, a wonderful night.